Hello everyone, this is Senior Biotech Analyst John Vandermosten. Welcome to our channel that educates the life sciences investor on exciting advancements in drugs, biologics, and devices. For more content and news like this, subscribe to our channel below and like or share with others. We're back with Reviva's CEO, Dr. Lexman Orion Bott. Reviva's lead candidate, Brolaroxazine, is an atypical antipsychotic wrapping up a phase three trial in schizophrenia. As part of the new drug application, a number of parallel registration studies are required. Dr. Bott, can you tell us about the findings from the drug-drug interaction study and its implications? Yeah, you know, the drug-drug interaction plays a very critical role in the treatment of uh, uh, schizophrenia. Often schizophrenia patients take multiple medications besides schizophrenia uh, medication. So drug-drug interaction uh, uh, is one of the major issue, at least based on the current literature, around one third of the side effects reported attributed to drug-drug interaction. Our drug in the drug-drug uh, interaction study that recently we uh, presented in an international conference has shown really very uh, minimal variation in presence of a strong inhibitor, CP inhibitor, as well as an inducer. So compared to other approved antipsychotics, uh, some of the widely used standard of care now to uh, increase the drug in presence of a strong inhibitor anywhere four times to 30 times. So our drug uh, in similar studies increased only around 10 to 15%. This is really, uh, we believe, based on the uh, other approved antipsychotics currently in the market, it's much cleaner, superior, uh, you know, safety profile in the drug drug. And, and I think I think you actually have in some of your materials a comparison of all of the um, all the products and kind of uh, you know how they they stack up on that CYP uh, yes. in inhibitor inducer um, comparison. So. Um, that's probably something we should refer to uh, at a, a later point to, to follow up on. And then, you know, you talked about drug interactions. Um, those are very important, especially in schizophrenia patients. Can you tell us why that, that is important for, for You this? know, the schizophrenia patients, uh, they suffer from multiple comorbidities, whether they are drug-induced or, uh, uh, you know, the associated with other uh, 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 symptoms, maybe various reasons. So major symptoms are associated with metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, and so on. So when a patient takes more than one medication, you expect to see one of the drug uh, level can alter uh, based on the how strong is other drug as a CYP uh, inhibitor or inducer. So in the schizophrenia, based on a recent article, over 76% of uh, uh, patients, they take more than five medications mm -hmm. other than schizophrenia treatment. And then 36% to 60% patients take 10 medications other wow. than schizophrenia medications. So this is very uh, a, a major concern, drug-drug interaction. Yeah. So our drug uh, has shown as a, in a very clean profile. Uh, some of the drugs, for example, uh, widely used antipsychotic uh, eripiprazole uh, in the U.S. brand name is Abilify. In the similar drug-drug uh, uh, interaction studies report in, a, in the presence of a strong inhibitor reported to increase around uh, four times higher than the concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also some other drugs like loracidone and then uh, quetiapine are known to increase anywhere 20 to 30 fold depending upon the other inhibitors. So overall, the majority of the standard of cares currently in the market are known to have a, uh, you know, in presence of other uh, strong inhibitor, uh, the drug levels are uh, reported to go up. That requires in some patients uh, titration of uh, the drug. Right, dose. which most physicians don't really want to get involved with. They Correct. just want to prescribe and, and let it kind of yeah. do its thing, right? Rather than getting involved in yeah. a weekly, because I think if you're titrating, you're you're coming back into the doc to see you yeah. know, how it's working, right? In other words, titration lead to uh, compromising efficacy. Uh, sure. you know, that's the major concern mm -hmm. in the treatment. So overall, if we can have a good handle on controlling drug-drug interaction, this can immensely benefit patients, not only uh, enhancing or uh, contributing to efficacy uh, by minimizing the side effect profile. And then overall, it can uh, improve the drug compliance. That is extremely important. Sure, in yeah, which is another really important, yeah, yeah. important thing as well. Uh, you know, the other point I want to bring up uh, was inflammation. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of my work in, in the CNS disease area and neurodegenerative disease, 
inflammation is, is being seen more and more as, as being a major driver of, of disease. Uh, and, and this also plays a role in mental illness as well. Um, so there's evidence that inflammation and, and immune system dysfunction are associated with schizophrenia. What, what are the implications of this and, and how does berloxazine fit in to address this so emerging ne issue? Neuroinflammation in schizophrenia, as a matter of fact, in all the neuropsychiatric uh, uh, you know, patients, whether it is a schizophrenia, depression, and other conditions, and then also neurodegenerative patient population, so what we know so far in the clinical literature, there is increased level of uh, pro-inflammatory markers or cytokines, mm -hmm. we call it. So inflammation, uh, addressing the uh, inflammation, uh, what we know so far, it can benefit or enhance the efficacy as well as it can mitigate the side effects, whether it is the drug induced uh, or as an organic cause of the disease itself the you know addressing neuroinflammation it can benefit patients in uh, mitigating the side effects to a great extent but the outcome uh, by addressing the neuroinflammation it could be multifold not only with uh, uh, enhancing the efficacy but also minimizing the side effects i think uh, addressing neuroinflammation is the key in the treatment of schizophrenia that we believe our drug based on the data generated today, now, uh, it has that benefit. If, if we look at first and second generation antipsychotics, did they address inflammation at all? So what we know so far with the current literature, the anti-inflammatory, in other words, reduction in cytokines, that's the kind of a marker to mm -hmm. evaluate whether mm -hmm. drug has an anti-inflammatory effect. Mm -hmm. So. The receptor activities, especially 5-HT7 and then 5-HT2B antagonist activities are primarily attributed to uh, the anti-inflammatory effect. To my knowledge, especially the 5-HT2B and then 7 combination of these, uh, our drug has the most potent activity compared to okay. other available. So others treatment. may have been doing it, but only to a very small degree. No, not all drug antipsychotics approved uh, uh, you know, uh, have 5-HT2B activity. Some mm -hmm. have 5-HT7, not 5-HT2B, okay. but both are uh, you need both. Im imp important okay. for, uh, you know, these two are considered as upstream targets for uh, mediating multiple cytokines. They are implicated in uh, inflammatory diseases or mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. Um, so schizophrenia is known for having three main features, uh, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and cognitive deficits. And I think some of those are related. Maybe you can tell us about that. But, but how do approved products address these elements and what's different about broloxazine for addressing positive, yeah. negative symptoms and um, cognitive deficits? You know, so often, uh, you know, general perception, uh, the dopamine targeted antipsychotics do not address, uh, you know, all the multiple symptom domains of schizophrenia. So, but if you look at carefully the approved antipsychotics, the all antipsychotics do not have, uh, you know, adequate activities for key receptors implicated in multiple symptom domains, as you highlighted. Schizophrenia is not a single disease. Rather, it is a, a mix of at least five different conditions. Mm. One is positive symptom, negative symptom, mood. Mood is a combination of depression and anxiety and cognitive impairment, lastly, neuroinflammation. We know more about neuroinflammation in the last uh, five to 10 years of literature. Prior to that, that knowledge was not available. Mm -hmm. So most of the approved antipsychotics are designed and developed uh, you know, 20 years back. Our drug uh, uh, designed and developed Post genomic era, we, so we had we had a lot more knowledge. Yes, since then you know to, to the, some of the precisely. human receptors, cloned receptors, were not available then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We fine tuned the molecule to specifically address these, uh, you know, target these receptors. That's why we believe our drug has a you know uh, a broader activity to address these specific symptom domains. Mm -hmm. So that you don't see with other approved antipsychotics. So that's the difference. Got it. Got it. Um, you know, another thing I thought might be interesting to pursue is just or, or explore is the half-life of schizophrenia drugs. I mean, they vary pretty widely. And, I, and I'm wondering, can you explain to us the importance of half-life and how that, that uh, plays a role in terms of efficacy and side effects and things like that? You know, s compliance is a major issue in the treatment of schizophrenia. The drug half-life 
contribute significantly that often in the shorter half life it requires either two or three times uh, uh, dosing regimen so our drug has around 60 hours half life and then this requires only one CD oral dosing mm -hmm. so if a patient uh, you know uh, forget to take medication one day uh, it's not going to affect uh, this one it's uh, overall outcome so Longer half-life, longer means a reasonably longer half-life. It's beneficial in the treatment of schizophrenia. And then besides this longer half-life, if a drug has a dose proportional PK, uh, pharmacokinetics profile, mm -hmm. that immensely help this patient population to mitigate some of the side effects associated with our drug. Uh, doesn't form any active metabolite. It is a dose proportional, in other words, uh, if a patient takes a 15 milligram of dose, it is a one can have a predictable uh, dose level uh, in the body, uh, in the systemic circulation compared to some of the other approved antipsychotics have a lot of variability that mm -hmm. won't have it with our drug. That's that so one. you can be more certain of, of how it's going to perform. It's a predictable uh, outcome dose proportional. That's very key, especially uh, for to uh, you know, estimate the efficacy or onset of action, we call it. Mm -hmm. And then also, to a great extent, find uh, to assess the side effects. So on, uh, you know, dose proportional uh, uh, absorption and then predictable PK is also contributing significantly uh, in the overall outcome of the treatment. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Bond. Thank you. Uh, we've had Dr. Laxman Arayan Bhatt, the CEO of Review of Pharmaceuticals here in the studio with us. Thank you. And uh, ticker symbol RVPH.